All right, all right, all right. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale, and as always over here, the slick Rick of the DJ over here, Mr. Kyle Phil. What's going on? What's going on? Uh, <laughs> Billy, what's going on, brother? Nothing, man. Getting ready to watch the UFC. Ooh-hoo-hoo. I know. I'm so excited. I can't believe it's on a Sunday. It's something because of the motocross. So they had yeah, to bump it. Yeah, is that a reason why? Yeah. I didn't know why. Yeah, they had to bump it back. So uh, Hendo and... And uh, was it Shogun Hua is fixing to face off mm-hmm. this evening? So yeah, there's going to be some going to be some good. good we had some friends that had good fights last night. Yes, they did. And I'm definitely going to give them a shout out. We trained with some people from uh, the Epic Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Gym, and uh, they we had three guys go up and fight in Oklahoma City last night, and all three of them come out with the win. Uh, Dylan Ashburn by guillotine. Dakota Ranallo, he had the rear naked choke, and Bobby Simpson had the Kimura. Absolutely so, awesome. So, yeah, I think uh, Bobby's went to the second round. I think he got him in the second, but Dylan's and Dakota's were all in the first round. Awesome job, so, guys. Yeah, great job. They trained hard. They went up there and laid the smack down. So, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to get with Monty and uh, check out the video. So that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. What else did we do That'd yesterday? We had, folks, if you haven't looked already, you can go to the Facebook page. I tweeted a few of the photos out, but go to the Facebook page, and we've been to the uh, Weird Text Fest. Yeah. And we got to hang out with our all of our old friends. We hung out with Ken Gerhard. We hung out with, with Nick Redfern, and then with uh, Lyle and Sandy Blackburn and Rita Louise. We've hung out with all of them, got our pictures made with them, and stood around over there at the tables and talked. Pretty much off Josh the Reeves. I got to Josh. meet Josh Ham. I've never met him before. So yep. we're going to get Josh to come on and talk more about the rock wall. And he after- invited us <sighs> to go look at some ancient mounds. Yep. To go and do some stuff actual with rock wall parts. Yep. So that's going to be cool. Yep. You know, and we had uh, Scott Walter on in the past. And, yeah. And then, you know, we've talked about the special and all that stuff. And then, you know, I've discussed it more off air about the rock wall. But after talking to Josh, man, there's a lot more to this than what's really. What's really been released just from that show? We kind of discussed well, that we even kinda, when Scott We kind of suspected that, too. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just an hour-long show. And by the time you get into the story, uh, they only have so much on television. There's a lot more to the story yeah. that wasn't shown on America Unearthed. I'm yeah. not saying Scott Walter was incorrect on his data on that show, but they only looked at one part. And it's supposed to be a mi- uh, like 20-something miles long. To me, you can't look at one part yeah. and rock and go, well, nope, it's all fake. I don't think he went all the way down. There was a lot of a lot of stuff, but where he checked it out is what he found. But yes. maybe you didn't check out the whole thing, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk to Josh and get the other side of it. That's the whole idea of expanding perspectives. Kind of keep your mind open, keep your eyes open. Let's get some more information on it and see what we can come up with. Well, and then, and during the conference he was giving, he also sells DVDs, and you can go to his website, Josh Reeves' website, yep. uh, theglobalreality.com. Suge- yeah, I suggest anybody go in there and buy those DVDs because I saw some clips from it. It looks awesome. He's got them in Blu-ray now, and the yeah. first one's like four hours long. Yeah, and the second one's two hours long. Yeah, so there's plenty of information <laughs> right there. But we had a great time. Hung out with Nick. Like I said, me and Nick and Kyle, we all chatted it up and talked and laughed with Rita. And went and we Nick did his uh, lecture on the real men in black. Mm-hmm. And then uh, hung out with, with uh, Lyle and Sandy. Yep. And picked up our hardback copies of The Beast. The last Boggy two, Creek. I believe. The last two that there are ever. Is, it was I a small that. run. Yeah. The way he was describing it, was only a, they only made a handful of them. Yeah. And it's the only one of his books that they ever made in hardback. And it was just like a one-run deal. And once they were gone, they're gone. And. I just happened to message him Friday. I'm like, hey, do you have any of those? He's like, I'll throw them in. Bring them there. I've been wanting to get it for a while. And uh, he brought them in. I was there, and I was like, hey, are those our two, or are those just for sale? And he's like, no, that's only two I got left. I go, Psh, give They're it to mine. me now. Bang. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, mine's autographed, so. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, we had a great time hanging out down there. It was fun. It's always fun to get to hang out with everybody. Uh, we missed Jason. Jason, one of our listeners, was down there, and I guess – between all the lectures and all that stuff, just in passing, we missed him because we were talking to him on Facebook just the other day. So oh, like, man. Yes, yes. I was like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Like, we hung out over there pretty much on that side. You know, there was three rooms, but I think one of the rooms only was for lectures. The other two rooms had vendors and lectures going on. So, anyway, we had a great time and all that stuff. But I like yeah. the handmade Ouija boards that were there. That was pretty cool. Right. I'm not a Ouija board fan. I'm not either, but if you're going to do it, hey, I like those antique-looking yep. ones. Those are pretty It was cool. all old-school looking, but they had some really neat lectures and really neat things going on, so I'm sure Did we'll... not have the best fried pie, though, I've ever had. <laughs> we... Oh, man, that was bad. Kyle and I stopped at this little place right outside of Glen Rose, Texas. And I'm not even going to give its name out, none of this stuff. But anyway, it, sold, it was selling what they called Glen Rose, uh, Texas is very small. It's a very small town. Yeah, it's just south of Granbury. I imagine population's, <laughs> what, 10,000 maybe? If it's even that many, I don't know. But anyhow, so we wheel into this place, and it was a, of course, it was like one of those restaurants or little things built into the travel side of, center. A, of a travel center. Yeah. And we're starving by this point. You know, I mean, me and Kyle, we have to eat. And we see this thing, it says, uh, all natural, all natural, mind you folks, fried pies. <laughs> 
the smart ass that sits across from me when we do this podcast instantly turns to me and Kyle says, what's natural about a fried pie? I don't think they grow on any fruit trees <laughs> anywhere. So we go in there and we go back and they make them fresh. Oh, we and didn't get, yeah, get into that debacle. We didn't yeah. know that either. We didn't know they made them fresh. We thought they were ready to go. Like they already had some made up. They had them warm, you know, because there's a sandwich shop here in the town we live in that makes fried pies. And they're amazing. Homes, and they're unbelievable. This name of this sandwich shop here in town is Hutch's, and it is unbelievably good. And that's awesome. what we were expecting. Yeah. That's what I was fresh, expecting. Fresh, ready to go. So I was like, mm, that sounds awesome oh, yeah. for breakfast. We wheel in there, folks. And you got to wait like 15, 20 minutes till they make these fried pies. Kyle and I, all we both ordered bacon, egg, and cheese. We got sausage, egg, and cheese. And they were so hot that, I mean, you couldn't eat them. So we, we left them in the, in the truck. Put them in we, the truck and left them. And we, we went inside. We did, you know, did our thing. We caught Josh's lecture and all that. We go back out to the truck to eat them. Still warm. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I make eggs at home, scrambled up eggs, they solidify. We bite into these pies. And these eggs ain't solid eggs. These are like egg beaters, like mixed with cheese, and it's just ooey. It's all liquid. It was it, all liquid. Oh. An hour and a half after I ordered it, it's still ooey. It's still liquid. Oh, it was whole. So that's something that was slightly paranormal. My fried pie isn't a real fried pie. It was a ghostly it fried supposedly pie. Supposedly was all natural. I'm like, what? There's is natural nothing natural in here. about that fried and pie. Even, okay, first of all, I ordered bacon. I didn't get bacon. I got sausage. What, what did I have? A speck of sausage? <laughs> I mean, one speck for the whole pie. I mean, could you find any sausage in there? No, I really couldn't. I, and, and she even wrote it on there, you know, sausage, egg, and cheese. I, no, I didn't. Mm. So anyway, that was that was the only Debbie Downer of the whole <laughs> trip with these gnarly, nasty fried pies. Of course, you know what, really and truly, that's what we get for eating a fried pie yeah, for you're breakfast, right. yeah. really. But you know what? We left early. We were like, eh, you know, we were going to stop and actually have a good breakfast, and we kind of left late. You know how it goes. You just... And we get down there, and we're like, look, last resort, let's just grab one of these front. Smelt good. And we walked in, smelt amazing. I was like, oh, this smells wonderful. Boy, was I wrong. Oh, man. And my stomach was upset later All on day. The day. All day, man. I felt terrible from the whole thing. So anyway, that was the debacle with the fried pies. Philly. <laughs> yes, sir. Who are we going to be chatting to? Tonight, we're talking to Jim Harold, man. Yeah, Jim's great. Now, several people have come out with an interview with Jim Harold. We actually we, we did this interview probably a month and a half ago. Yeah, We've had it for a while. Yeah, for the folks that are listening that, that have came over from Jim's uh, podcast, yeah, we actually interviewed Jim, interviewed before Jim like the night or two before I was on his show. So there's several other podcasts that have released it already. We've had it really. Oh, it's been over a month that we've talked to Jim. So it, we've just been so backed up with interviews. I mean, we've got so many people we've got to get. We've talked to and we've got to get out. So. Yeah, this is the whole thing. So anyway, we had a great time talking. Jim's a wonderful person. Absolutely. Great. Tell some really wonderful, creepy ghost stories. I love his books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just because they're just great short stories. You go in there and you read them. And I like the fact that it's from every listener. The listeners are the ones that call in and tell him the stories the same as I did. So, I mean, it was That's what I like about it. It wasn't like he researched the internet and found stories. Because, you know, if you do that sometimes, which happens to us all the time, you'll start researching a topic and you're like, I've heard this story. I've heard this story. You know, because everybody's... That's like the most popular paranormal story on that subject. What this is so neat about this is this is his actual listeners that call in and give their own personal yeah. stories. So I really like that. And, and and it's all types of stuff, too, not just ghosts. Don't think it's just ghosts. There's extraterrestrial stuff. There's uh, time slips, uh, dreams, you know, near-death experiences. Yeah. I mean, there's just all there's kinds of great it's, stories. It's really neat. So he was a blast. And, uh, and Jim's got a great, like, on-air voice. Yes, He's he got does. a real good storytelling voice, and I really like that, too. So mm-hmm. We had a great time talking to Jim, and we hope you all enjoyed as much as we had doing it. Yeah, so stay with us after the break. We're going to get into that interview. We're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
All right, guys, we've got a treat for you today. Joining us on the line is the man himself of all paranormal podcasts, the godfather, Mr. Jim Harrell. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, and it's uh, great to be with both of you. Well, and, and it's it's a true introduction. I mean, you you have really you've laid down the groundwork for what quality sound and quality podcasting really is, and it's something that Kyle and I have really tried to to strive to. And we've we've got a few guys that we want to work to be like and emulate, and it's, and you're one of them. You've kind of made the group, so this is a really a big treat for us. Well, it's a treat for me as well. So I'm so glad to be with you and uh, your listeners and really looking forward to talking some paranormal tonight some ghost stories yeah kyle and i are kind of like we've always been interested in the ghosts and the ghost stories and things because it's it's just it's like in i guess it's pretty much all of american history and folk tales it's it's always been there you always hear something about the battlefields or the the ghost of the old haunted houses and things like that and i've even had a, a personal experience with something like that and I guess it never really, I never really doubted it as, as growing up. I never did. And then listening to certain people, it's like they always seem to have the doubts sometimes. Have you ever come across some people that just, no matter what of all the things that you've read or are received, that you are like, how can you doubt this anymore? Yeah, I, I think we run into people who that, and and in some ways, you know, you get a lot of that from the, quote, skeptical community. And it's interesting because I think sometimes, and I'm not saying all skepticism is bad. Some skepticism is really good. And I, I kind of think I'm a skeptical believer. My default position is, you know, you've got to convince me that this, this is real, this particular thing you're telling me. But I think that these people almost have like a religious fervor that none of this can be true. And it all has to be, it all has to be false. And, and to your point, not only have these reports gone back in American history, They've gone back in worldwide history since the beginning of recorded history and oral history, people talking about spirits and visitations. So this isn't something that's new. And a lot of the stories that we get, and I'm sure you hear the same thing, are from very credible people. And uh, there, you know, there's just too much smoke not to be at least some fire. I had one time had Michael Shermer on the show, one of the programs. He's one of America's foremost uh, skeptics he's actually i believe he's the editor of skeptic magazine if i'm not mistaken he's right there with james randy as a skeptic <laughs> and i said look you know i i think a large percentage of these things you know people think are paranormal may not always be paranormal we actually probably agree a lot of the time that maybe people you know see sometimes what they want to see and hear what they want to hear but what about that percentage that you can't explain away that small percentage where there's absolutely no explanation he says well, we know that exists, but we just put that up on the shelf. And I'm like, wait a minute. Put it up on a shelf. You need to take it down. You need to examine it because all it takes is one. And you just admitted that there are plenty of cases that you can't explain. So I just think it's almost like a religiosity. And, and, and these people get into it and, oh, none of this could be true. And it's so funny because almost, almost anybody you talk to, even if they're pretty skeptical, they always say something like this. Well, I... I don't believe in that stuff. <laughs> but there was that one time. <laughs> and then they tell you their ghost story. It's funny you bring that up because just since we've started the podcast, Kyle and I have always, you know, read and researched all these different different levels of guess of esoteric things. And it wasn't until we started the podcast and people started really even our, our closest friends started really paying attention did we start getting stories and approached by these people. Uh, about things that they've never spoken of before. Like, they'll pull you over to the side and be like, hey, uh, I got to tell you something. This this happened to me, you know, when I was a kid, or this happened to me just a right. few weeks ago. And it's it's funny because it happens. Everybody has some sort of something strange that's happened to them, whether they played it off or not. But it's almost like they're not willing to talk about it. It seems like you have got to – you're the man that they're all willing to talk to about it. And they send you all their stories, and it just – you're kind of the collector almost. Yeah, you know, when I started, I started podcasting back in 2005 doing the Paranormal Podcast, which uh, is, is still going, and it's an interview show where I talk to authors and experts uh, about their books and so forth, and have always enjoyed that immensely, but a few years later, I got an idea to do a special show in 2009, I think it was. I'll do a show where the listeners give their stories, and I was just blown away by 
the quality of the stories and the interest from the audience. I'm like, wait a minute, there's a second podcast here. And we started the pod, uh, the Campfire podcast in 2009. And uh, really, you know, I love talking to the authors, and I still love that to this day, and that's great. You know, I, I admire their work and give them all the credit in the world for really delving into it because I'm not the expert. They're the experts. But... Um, uh, there's something about that campfire show and hearing real people because most of the people that I talk to are not people who see a ghost around every corner. Many times, you know, they'll be 30, 40, 50 years old and they have one experience. But that one experience is just tremendously, tremendously powerful to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just one of the, the, the greatest things. I, I, I just love it. Well, and that's... You bring up that's kind of what happened to me is I'd had a connection with my grandmother and uh, on my mother's side of the family. And I was actually the last person that she spoke to before she passed away. She had had a massive stroke, was in a coma, the whole thing. And, you know, was in there visiting with her and the rest of the family had gotten up and left. And it's like she woke up from a, from a nap and looked up and talked to me for just a few seconds and was wow. just as clear as you and I are speaking today and talked to me for, you know, five, six seconds. And told me she loved me and then went right back into that whole deal. And when I went out and left the room and all that, she she passed away not too long after that. The nurses came back in and all that, and of course. So she lived maybe 15 minutes but was never coherent after that and had been out of it for over 24 hours before. So I always felt real special. I'm like I was the last person that she spoke to, and it made me feel real good. And maybe there was a reason, you know, that she spoke to me and all that. Right. So you fast forward a few years, and my grandfather was – uh you know, a, a war veteran had been in on Normandy and all that stuff. And he was a, a, a great grandpa, you know, he's all American granddad. And you, we watched baseball together and he was always in his overalls outside work. And, you know, and it was just great growing up like that. But he was a, also a no nonsense kind of guy. Now he was a Mason and, and he was a deacon in the church and all that, but he was still a real straightforward, no nonsense kind of guy. <clears throat> about four, about three years after my grandmother had passed away, you know, it was hard on him. They'd been married for, ooh, close to 60 years when she passed away so i come over to see him one day after work i stopped by and i'm talking to him and he's like well your grandmother came to visit me last night and i said did you did you dream about her he goes no son she came to visit me and oh my. i and i knew when he said something like that that it was serious that he meant business because he didn't like i said there was no never anything like that with him so right. i sat across from the kitchen table and him with his coffee and i sat there and i was like well what happened and he told me that he was in bed, and he had just laid down to go to sleep and stretched out. And, of course, like I said, as long as I can remember, they always slept in separate bedrooms. So right. he was in his bedroom. He laid down. He said he felt something at the foot of his bed. Sit down. Well, he always kept a pistol right on his nightstand. Mm -hmm. So he reached for his pistol, and he opened his eyes, and he said, it was my grandmother. And he said, not like she was. He said, like she was the day I married her. He said she was beautiful. She was young again. She was standing there. And he said, I sat there and I said, are you OK, Mama? And she laughed and she said, yeah, I'm doing just fine. And he said, I sat up on the bed and he said, I talked to her for about 10 minutes. Wow. And told her how much I missed her and how much I cared for. And he said, I'm setting up. And he said, when I set up, she stood up or she could see me at the foot of my bed. I spoke to her and she told me everything was OK when I was ready to come home that she had it all taken care of. And wow. he said she turned and walked down the hall and went back into her bedroom. And he said he just laid down, had the best sleep of his life. He lived five more years after that, but was a changed man after that. It was probably a year or so after he had that experience. I was in my home getting ready to leave one afternoon. I walked up to my front door where we hung our keys. We had a mirror that hung beside the door where we always had our keys and all that. And my chair was kind of, you know, to my back right shoulder. Right. And I turned to grab my keys and I looked and my grandmother was sitting in that chair. And she was sitting in there. She looked the way I always remembered her, sitting there with her, you know, her little lotions and all. You know, she just looked like my little grandmother. Right. And I'd looked at her for easily 30 seconds. I couldn't talk to her, but it, the room felt warm. It felt like happiness. And I just sat there and I smiled and she smiled and, and I couldn't talk and she didn't. And I didn't ever turn around. I never did anything. After I watched her for about 30 seconds, she was just sitting in the chair smiling at me. We locked eyes, the whole thing through the mirror. I turned and went out the door and never looked back and came back that afternoon and, or that evening, and that was it. But that's kind of my <laughs> ghost stories of the whole thing. So <laughs> I'm pretty good. Yes. Pretty good ones at that. <laughs> so I've I, never had a doubt from now. From that point forward, I'm like, 
yeah, they're always kind of around you one way or the other. And I think it's interesting, a point you bring up, the idea that we see somebody as we remember, maybe if they've been sick or something, but we see them as we remember them or we see them in the prime of life or in good health. And I think that's very reassuring as well to just know that, you know, if, if they passed under some distress, medical distress, those type of, obviously medical distress if you pass away, um, that that's not the way they are. They, they kind of revert mm-hmm. back to, to, you know, better times and, and better condition and so forth. And that was interesting how you said uh, um, your loved one was a changed man. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that that was fascinating to me because I think that would change somebody. And I, I'm sure, you know, as you grow older, having an experience like that, I would think would be very reassuring because, you know, your time is eventually all of our t- we're, <laughs> all of our times are eventually coming. It's just a question of when. Well, and that's, and like I said, Especially he was when a, you're a little older and you, you know that you're a little closer. Yeah. And, and he was, like I said, a great grandpa, but you could tell he was, he was sad. He was very depressed after she had passed. And from that night forward, he wasn't, he was, he was out and, and visiting with everyone. I mean, it completely, like his mind had been put at ease. I mean, yeah. Like he yeah. was totally at rest again. And, and it was, and it was pro- really neat to see. Mm. And he probably knew that eventually he would rejoin her. Yeah. What's funny is he never spoke about this with the rest of my family. Mm-hmm. He didn't mm-hmm. tell them any of that stuff because I asked him, I said, did you tell my because my mother and her sister, nope, didn't speak anything to any more about him, the whole deal. I don't know. I guess I just happened to catch him the day of it happened. And then, of course, wow. but it, it's also something with men of that age, too, you know, from that time. They didn't really sure. share a lot. So, yeah. Did you have, Jim, any personal experience that got you down the paranormal path like that before you ever well, started podcasting? Well, um uh, two things. I mean, I've been interested in the paranormal since I was a little kid. I remember, and I tell this on the show many times, Leonard Nimoy in search of and all oh, of that yeah. stuff. Oh, yes. And my dad had some some great couple of great stories that he told, which I think kind of cued me up for it. But uh, one thing that did happen to me, not as dramatic as your story, uh, but happened to me, um, oh, about, geez, about 15 years ago now. Uh, my brother passed at a pretty young age he was in his uh, late 20s and uh, he was autistic and he had passed away and uh, my family at that time lived down in West Virginia and I'm up here in northern Ohio so we went down to the funeral it was very unexpected and we were coming back and we're flipping through the radio stations and you know when you're in a hilly kind of mountainous rural area you know maybe the stations don't come in that well a station will fade in and fade out so every find yourself every 20 minutes tuning to a new radio station and one of these uh, kind of music of your life stations was on uh, like uh, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra that kind of music so anyway we left it on there for a little while and I heard this instrumental and I'm like I can't place that but it sounds familiar now uh, something you should know my brother uh, autistic and and he loved music but he loved all kinds of music he liked uh, country music and soul music and he had just like this real real kind of <laughs> kind of wild taste in music and in something else he also loved was of all things lawrence welk because he was still on the tv as we were growing up and then in pbs and reruns he loved lawrence welk that was one of his top three artists i think <laughs> uh, over the top any- eclectic <laughs> yeah exactly i think george Strait was right next to, in that group too <laughs> uh but anyway um so you should know that. So anyway, I'm listening to this thing, and, and keep in mind that, you know, I only could have tuned into this station for a very short amount of time, and at that particular time, and the instrumental's done playing, and the disc jockey does the back announce, and he says, well, of course, that was Lawrence Welk with his big hit from 1960, Calcutta. <laughs> and I thought, okay. What are the chances I'm driving through this particular part of the world at this particular time and I tune it on a station to somebody you never hear and have hit a, hear an instrumental, happen to tune in right when the DJ is saying it, and it happens to be somebody you never hear on the radio. And it happens to be Lawrence Welk who is extremely – it wasn't just like somebody he kind of liked. It was like one of his all-time <laughs> favorites. Yeah. To me, it was kind of an indirect way of my brother saying, hey, don't worry about me, big brother. I'm okay. All's and that's well. the way I took it. That's the way I took it. Now, maybe that's me just, again, you know, hearing what I want to hear, believing what I want to believe. But that that told me there was, was something going on there. Man. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Now, you have two books, is that correct? 
Yes. Um, we have the first one. We have uh, your first campfire stories, but I understand there's a new one out. Yes, there is a new one out. Which, and actually, first, yeah. before we get started, which is impressive because it's a number one Kindle. It's like a Kindle number one book. Yeah, actually, it's so funny. I went the traditional route with the first book, and I liked the first book. I thought it was a good book and worked with some great people to publish it, and it did okay. The second book, um, and I'll have to get you a copy of that. Um, the second book uh, I'm extremely proud of. I think it's a stronger book. Just, you know, you do something a second time, and it's a, it's a little bit uh, stronger, and you kind of learn some lessons from the You were the first prepared time. this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, it, yeah, it was the number one Kindle bestseller in its category of Supernatural uh, for several weeks right around the Halloween time is when we uh, released it. And it's still doing pretty well. It uh, fluctuates in the top ten there in, in that particular. And what's great about what I love about it, since I, this time I decided to kind of go the loan, I control everything so I can make it a little more affordable for people. The Kindle book's only $2.99, and uh, it's... Uh, True Ghost Stories, Jim Harold's Campfire 2, 70 spooky stories that will keep you up at night. And they'll definitely do that because this book's got something <laughs> Yeah, we read do the it. first one, and it's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if you like the first one, you'll love the second one because I've consistently gotten uh, that comment. Like the first one, love the second one, and we're working on a third one now. But, yeah, it did very, very well. Um, it's available in Kindle for two ninety nine. I believe uh, paperback is nine ninety nine. And Amazon, it's exclusively through Amazon, so you can get it pretty easily. And I think that, uh, you know, it's just great to have this flexibility. It's kind of like what we're doing with podcasts. I just decided I wanted to do certain things kind of the way that I wanted to do them and to have that flexibility to do it and make it more affordable for people, yep. uh, which I can do because I can control the pricing. I think it's great. You know, it's a 250 page book you can get for $2.99 on the Kindle, or you don't even need a Kindle. Uh, if you have a computer, you can use the free Kindle app. If you've got a tablet or a phone, you can use the free Kindle app. So it's a great way to get it out there to as many people as possible. And it's perfect. And the, and the fact that nowadays that you can do that, that you can self-publish and, and control everything, you don't have to go out and try to get a big book deal signed. It makes it easier to get all the information out to people, too. And that's what I love about it, is it's easily to get this information or easier than it did maybe 10 years ago. To get this, yeah, podcasting is a great medium. I mean, oh yeah, that's what I like oh, yeah. about it. It's not regulated, you know. Well, here's the. I see. I worked in radio for. Well, I started in radio in the early '90s, but I worked behind the scenes. My my background had been uh, in school uh, training for bi uh, broadcasting. A bit of that as I stumbled <laughs> through my work, <laughs> I took the correspondence course. But no, um, anyhow. Uh, I didn't end up doing it. Uh, I ended up working on the business side, which was fun. I enjoyed it, but I always was envious of those guys behind the mic because that's really what I wanted to do. And fast forward to 2005, I have a wife, I have two kids, I have a mortgage, I have responsibilities, I'm in my mid-30s, and I say, I guess that dream is gone. And uh, heard about this little thing called podcasting. It was in its very early days back then. And I listened to some of the big deal podcasters like Leo Laporte and Adam Curry, the old MTV VJ. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ah, I don't know. I can't compete with those guys. But then I listened to some of the homemade ones. And I said, well, I could comp compete with them. I can do that. I can do that. And uh, I started and I just kind of started on a whim as a hobby. And I put out a show and then I go three, four weeks and not put out a show. And I did that for a couple of years. And... One day I can remember I was at a t-ball game, one of my kids' t-ball games with my wife, and I, I had seen right before I left, I got another email. When are you coming out with a new show? And it's like, what am I doing? People want to listen to this show. I'm going to get serious. And I got serious, and with six months, within six months we had a sponsor, and then I noticed I was working my full-time job, and just things keep getting, getting busier and busier and busier with the podcast and more listeners, and I'm like, wait a minute. I might be able to do this as a job. So... Two years ago, I um, quit the full-time job and made this my full-time job, and uh, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it, and what a great way to make a living. Well, both of your shows are outstanding, like we said before. We, I mean, we love them, we, the, the interviews and all that stuff, and it's always, like everybody else, I fall back to the ghost stories. If you want to listen, it's like, oh, I love the ghost story stuff when you bring it up, and 
the books were great. I just, I, I, that's where I get a lot of my information. When we start talking about the ghost story things, I love listening to the accounts of everyday people. The people you bump into on the street have some of the best stories, and there would be no reason to be made up. I mean, it's there's nothing to gain from telling these stories. I mean, there's there's no fame and notoriety and money involved. It's just shelling. No, and I like it that the, the actual the people that experienced it are calling in and giving their rendition of the story or their experience. So you're getting to hear these people's mm-hmm. experiences, and it's you know, and it's like a safe place to tell everybody. And some of these people. You know, often have stories that they don't really share with anybody, but they'll come on Jim's podcast and tell it. I mean, some of those stories are amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Would you like to hear a story from my latest book? This is one of my favorites. It's not a traditional traditional ghost story, but I think you'll find it interesting. This goes back all the way to 1961, and it spread from Colorado who called in and told this story. And these are some of the most... When people call about stories that happened 20, 30, 40 years ago to them uh, as, when they were a child. Now, uh, Frank was five years old, and he lived in Illinois. His dad was in the service, and he was there with his mom. I kind of got the impression it was kind of like where the, the families lived, the military families, when the, the dads at that time were out uh, serving. And uh, they lived in a little house that was probably built around the 20, turn of the 20th century, and he said he was never comfortable in it. He said that the house frightened him. He had a lot of nightmares. But one night he had uh, a nightmare that has stayed with him to this day. And there's a real kicker to this story I'll tell you about in a little bit. (laughs) He'd gone to sleep, and in the dream he was in his backyard. There was a hill in the backyard, and a door opened out of the hill. And a figure came out of the hill and was chasing him. The person had a long black coat on and had long fingers with knives on them. He said that he was running from this figure and he fell. And in his dream, he was trying to drag himself away. And just before this figure got to him, he woke up. And at the time, he shared a room with his sister, who was four years old. He woke, uh, he woke up and he told her, get mom, I can't move my legs. So they get the mom. Now, remember, this is 1961. So they call the doctor and the doctor does a house call. Yeah, right. And the doctor says, who scared this child so badly? He's He's got paralysis, fear-induced paralysis. And um, he said uh, he had a nightmare. So anyway, over the course of a, a week or so, his, uh, his grandma came over and did like this rudimentary physical therapy with him, got his legs moving again. And he said that he had been a normal little boy with no health uh, issues, but but throughout his childhood and adolescence, he would have this dream, and it would be when he would get sick. It never got to the point of as far as it got in that time. It was very, very scary. So let's forward to 1988, 27 years later. And he had a friend who uh, uh, he used to go walking with, and she said, hey, Here's a tape of a movie you ought to watch. It's called Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> so he goes home, and he pops in to the VHS. That dates the story a little bit. <laughs> Turns it on, and he says, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Because when I first saw the Freddy Krueger character, I realized this was the person who was in his nightmare in 1961. Freddie killed kids in their dreams. He said he always told his mother, I thought that if he'd caught me, he would have killed me. I would have died in my sleep. I lived that movie over 20 years before it was made, Frank from Colorado says. Holy Man, smokes. that is insane. From 61. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. <laughs> I mean, there's no explaining that, really, other than there's just no way to explain it. Yeah, the only thing now, I've had uh, a couple of people uh, give me a couple theories, because I always tell that one when I go on shows, because it's one of the, the, the real striking ones, I think. Um, maybe he was tapping into some kind of collective consciousness. You know, and someone told me on one program, and I'm not familiar with this, I haven't, um, I haven't researched it, so it's only secondhand, but said that there was, were some Asian cultures that were having issues with this, that, that kids were having nightmares and dying, and that's where the whole idea of Freddy Krueger came from. I don't know if that's true or not, but the interesting thing is is that in his story he explains he's of Asian lineage. And maybe there's something culturally that tied into that. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. But all I know, it's a spooky, spooky story. Yeah, that is spooky. <laughs> that's, 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 that's that is a spooky odd. story. I'm, 
I wonder if the the guy that created the Freddy Krueger character um, had similar experiences as a child, or had, had heard these folk tales or these stories. Right, yeah, because right. um, you hear um, in these exorcism cases where you know where the priest that's performing the exorcism will ask the demon its name, and it'll have like a name or something. Maybe this Freddy Krueger type character preys on multiple children, and so like he was saying, a collective vision. Maybe, maybe several people have shared that idea. That's insane. Yeah, that is. I, I got to tell you, that's one of those things where you just um, you just shake your head and say, "I don't know." To be I so mean, scared where you can't move, I can't even I imagine, can't imagine that. that. Yeah, yeah, that's frightening. That's right. And, and for days, it wasn't just like a temporary thing. You couldn't. It, it wasn't was like, like ten minutes. Days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jeez. I had heard of the story that you tell of a, a couple that had a time slip. A man and his wife. Oh, yes. time, and Kyle and I have done some stories and shows about time slips and read several books. We're fascinated with that subject as far as the time slip because some of it's missing time people have, and then some of it's where they actually account for being in different actual times. Yeah, like medieval at. times all of a sudden. Have you got any more than than one, or is that like the only time slip story you've dealt with? No, actually, uh, in, in the other... Um in in this book that uh, the campfire too, um, and and this one I've not told too much, but I'll go through it quickly. It's interesting. Um, it's called "Walking into Another Time." Now, this is one of our listeners. Uh, I believe it's uh, Sandy from California. She's one of our uh, very faithful uh, listeners. Yes, and um, she, when she was, I believe she was a teenager, she was going to visit one of her friends. And he lived about a mile from uh, uh, her house, so she decided she'd walk there. Then she was actually in her 20s. It was mid-November or so. The sun was setting behind her. It was about 4 p.m., so there were no leaves left on the trees. And she said she was walking through her suburban neighborhood to get to her friend's house, and she was looking down at the ground. That's what she says she tends to do. So anyway, just as a She was about to make a turn on the road that takes kind of a dog leg. She turns off the left and straightens out. All of a sudden, she said she felt her body being heated by the sun. Now, this was, I believe, in Pennsylvania, so it was kind of a northern climate. So it was cold. And she felt the sun wash over her body. She looked down at the ground, and her feet were bare, and she was on a dirt road. And she says all of a sudden, she felt like she was in a different place in a different time. She says the time of year was different. It was more like late spring. The leaves were fresh and green. She could see bugs flitting around, and she said she was in a wooded area standing in a clearing. She was uh, off the road a bit. She said all the houses that were there were gone, and she was looking up at the sun, and the sky was crystal blue. And she looked at her hands, and she realized that she too had changed, that she was about 11 or 12 years old. And she said the only thing that was similar in her physicality was the hair was the same color, but it was tied up in pigtails. So obviously she thinks, where am I at? Who am I? What's going on? (laughs) So she said, she thought, well, maybe if I just relax a bit, my name will come back to me. She was curious. Who am I right now? So anyway, she said it was a quite beautiful scene. She could hear a horse coming down where the road straightened out. And she thought, okay, this is good. Someone's coming down the road. Maybe they'll know my name and where I live and so on and so forth. She said there was a horse that emerged from the trees. There was a guy on a wagon. She thought, maybe I'll check out his clothes and look at the hardware on the wagon and try to figure out what time I'm in. She waited for him to get closer, and the horse was clopping along very slowly, and she raised her hand up and said, hi, mister, and she knew his name. Wow. She didn't. She, and she thought, wow, where did that come from? Now, she was very excited. She was waiting for him to answer her back. And he looked like she was really bothering him. And he just said, howdy. <laughs> she thought, damn. <laughs> you know, maybe she could go over to him. But then she thought, I might appear crazy. And that, you know, if this is the olden days, not, not, not nice to to people who have mental disorders so anyway she just stood there and thought what do i do where do i go uh her brain started kicking into survival mode because she figured she might not go back to the 20th century 
At this point, she had been there 10 or 15 minutes, and she thought, okay, I'd what start do panicking. I do now? Yeah, yeah. She figured she was a little girl, so she'd have to get somewhere where she could be safe. She thought if she could head towards town, wherever that is, maybe someone would recognize her. She could find a newspaper, find out the dates in the town she was in because she wanted this data. So if she did go back to motor time, she could research it. So she was thinking about that. She didn't know which way the town was. She said she could have been on her own property and her house could have been 300 feet away from her, but she just didn't know it. Now, since she was facing the direction where the man had come down from, she thought, well, maybe if uh, that was headed towards town. She said, well, I might have to walk 5 or 15 or 20 miles, but I've got to start and at least I have the whole day in front of me and most likely I'll find a uh, farmhouse somewhere. So she started to proceed to find out the road to who she was and as quick as a flash, her feet were back on asphalt again. Her body was cold. It was drizzling a little bit. She was back. Wow. wow. And she said, what the heck just happened to me? <laughs> yeah. Man, I love those time slip stories. Isn't that crazy? I mean, the thing is, is that there's, I, I absolutely believe it. I mean, there's tales throughout history of people who showed up that shouldn't be at a certain place or in a certain time, or they seem like they were out of time and space and who's to say that's that's why my philosophy behind all of this is if we think we've got this thing the universe figured out i think we're crazy because there's so much there's so much that we can't understand i i think our our uh, you know our understanding's like a thimble and what's really going on is like the ocean and God bless science. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now. You used to have to have a satellite to do this. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think it's great, and technology is great, and I love my iPhone like everybody else. But my point is, is that I think sometimes we get too enamored with our own knowledge and figure, ah, oh, that couldn't be. We've got it all figured out. And again, one of my favorite examples, you know, this could be something that's totally explicable scientifically. It's just the science of two or three hundred years from now. DNA has always existed. But a hundred years ago, scientists didn't know it existed. It didn't mean it didn't exist. It just didn't mean they had the tools, instruments, and knowledge to pick up on it. So my point is, is that this may all be science-based, quote science-based, but science that we don't have yet. Because as smart as we are, we've got a heck of a lot more to learn. I, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, I agree. It, it just feels like it, there's just there's too many of them that make too much sense on those time slips. And there's, like you said, in a hundred years, maybe we look be able to look back at this and everyone know, like we do with DNA now. Everybody laughs at it because I know that there was a little business. What was it called? Twenty three and Me that could actually chart your DNA for about a hundred dollars right. when it used to be tens of thousands, not ten right. years ago to do it. So. Right. Hopefully, I'm all about figuring out time slips. I don't know that I want to be involved in one, <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm all I'm about figuring one out. That. Well, if you could come back, it would be too bad. Yeah. Well, I've always <laughs> thought that would be the coolest thing. If your safety could absolutely be assured and you could be a fly in the wall and you wouldn't go into the whole grandfather paradox where you change everything, but you could just watch. Wouldn't it be neat to go back and watch uh, historic events or maybe – solve great mysteries maybe we find out you know who uh killed jfk or uh, who jack you know, the what, ripper was or, or who jack yeah. the ripper yeah. was or things i mean that would be very interesting i guess intellectually uh but then you get into the whole question you know by your very presence do you change history and then you get into the idea of the multiverse which you know some scientists are really accepting now the idea that there are many different realities and and you know somewhere uh uh, you're a guest on my show or other than the other way around. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm down south and you're up north. I mean, this idea that they're endless multiverses, I don't know that I believe it, but I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting thought that even traditional science is opening to that, that reality may be far more complicated and complex than, than it seems to be. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, we're, Jim, we're laughing and, and making small talk and having a good time with these, but have you ever had a few stories that maybe you didn't put in the book or didn't really pursue because they were, they felt like there was a lot of evil laid in there with them, a lot of darkness. If there's like, they've always said, if there's light, there has to be darkness. And have you ever gotten some very, very disturbing stories? 
I think I have one story that I didn't put on the show once just because I found it so disturbing. I can't even remember the details of it, but I found it so disturbing I didn't even put it on the so show. So you have had yeah, one so of those happened, happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, none that I've been, you know, if they end up on the show, they're game for the, the books if they're, 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 they're interesting stories. I've had some very disturbing ones, though. Um, one comes to mind, I can't remember the, the, uh, the specific uh, specifics of it, uh, I don't. They're not in the book, and it's not in front of me. But essentially, a young man was, um, he was very young, and he was essentially picked up in a bar by an evil entity. He was, I guess, I don't know, eighteen or nineteen years old, picked up by an, what he thought was an evil entity, um, like you know, picked up like a date. Right. He yeah. was later married to that evil entity. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The succubus. Probably a, few, probably a few people out there who have experienced that. Um, also, um, I think that, um, I, I think some of the Ouija board stories are, are pretty That's, spooky. That was oh, my, yeah. next, my next question. Was why does it always seem like the Ouija board ties into some really, really creepy things? There's a story... I'm not going to give it away of where it is in the book, anything like that. But in this first book that pertains to a lava lamp and a Ouija board. Oh, yeah, I, I'll give it away. Oh, that story, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's about enough of that. I don't want to hold on to that I one. don't have it in front of me, but I, I think I remember well enough. I believe this was a Leanne in Utah, if I remember correctly. And um, basically, her and a friend, uh, they were teenage girls, and they had the whole deal, the candles lit and everything, and they were playing with a Ouija board. And uh, I think her friend said, well, if you're really here, you know, the, the, something starts spelling out stuff on the board. And, um, you know, and obviously probably one thought the other one was doing it with the planchette and moving it around. And someone said, well, if you're really a spirit and you're really here, give us a sign. Now, remember, all the lights were turned out except for maybe some candles and a lava lamp. And if you remember that, if you're old enough to remember that like me, that's a lamp with the like gloopy stuff in the middle like wax almost that kind of forms into globs and moves around so anyway and i like to think that it's a red lava lamp because it fits better i, I did too right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um all of a sudden they start to they notice that the gloopy stuff in the middle of the lava lamp is forming into the some uh, uh, into something after they ask this question and they look at it, and it starts to turn into the head of a devil figure with mm. teeth and very, very pronounced. Not like it kind of, not like ink blot. It kind of, sort of looks like a, you know, like you see a cloud in the sky. Kind of looks like a dog. No, this looked like a devil growling at them in great detail. Mm. In great detail, yeah. and then um, I believe the, there were some, there were some lights or some electric that went off, and then they ended up shutting the Ouija board. And then the lava lamp turned back to normal. So, <laughs> and a lot of screaming and slamming doors. Yeah. And yeah. Stuff like that. yeah. So essentially, you know, again, I, here's the way I look at it. And this is my personal belief. Not that I cast aspersions on anybody that uses Ouija boards. We had, for example, uh, Karen Dahlman, who's written a couple of books. She believes that the Ouija board can be a tool uh, to be used for, for good. Uh, you know, so there are people out there that believe that, and that's that's fine. They have a right to their opinion. But for me, after hearing all these different stories, I think I just ran around. Uh, someone submitted a story just today about a Ouija board that's going to be on the show uh, next week or two. Nice. And um, just after all the stories I've heard, it's just kind of like, why, why, um, why risk it? I think one of my callers once said something like this, that they were told by uh, a spiritualist or someone who's expert in these matters, and it kind of makes sense to me. It's kind of like getting a Ouija board out and summoning things. It's kind of like dressing up in your best jewelry and walking down the worst neighborhood in your city <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning. You're kind of... I hate to say asking for it, or you're making yeah. yourself susceptible yeah, I to I agree. That's, that's why I don't, like to, I don't like to mess with that stuff. That's why people have invited me on uh, ghost hunting expeditions and stuff, and I'm like, no way, man, <laughs> because I, I've heard of them following you home. You know, I don't need that trouble. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've been doing this for nine years. I've never been on one. I've come close. I, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't go on one. 
Uh, but I do think about that, certainly. And with Ouija boards, I won't, uh, I think there actually is a Ouija board in the house. I remember maybe, uh, maybe way before I did the podcast, maybe 16, 17 years ago, uh, playing with it once with some friends, but I, I'm just too creeped out about it. I, I just won't mess with it, especially after I've heard all these kind of cautionary tales. <laughs> well, that's why I remember messing around with one as a young, as a young Yeah, man. I had one when I was a kid. But I don't even like walking by them. If you see them in the stores, it's I'm like, no, nope, I don't want no part of that right there, man. I don't want no part of that. <laughs> I mean, that's the perfect analogy. You gave the perfect analogy. I'm like, nah, uh, I don't want nothing to do with it because it always there's always a connotation. It ne- it's never like was it what was her name Glinda the Good Witch from the Wizard of Oz. It's right. never like she shows up. I'm like, oh yeah. hey, you know, it's great. I got some good news for you. It's never that. No, <laughs> or no, it may no, come no. forward as that, but that's not how it ends up. Yeah, well, actually, we have one in this latest book, i got to tell you. Uh, actually, I think it was the same gentleman who used that analogy. It's called the walking Ouija board. Uh, the walking? The walking Ouija, yes. Oh, wow. So, um, now, this is kind of different, uh, and I believe the guy's name's Gabriel, and I think he's from Texas, of all places. Um, Don't wish that evil on us down here, Jim. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. I'm like, hey, maybe he's a neighbor. But uh, he was a teenager, and he started getting into spirituality, and uh, he had this spiritual teacher who would teach him these different lessons. And this is really pretty freaky. So one day, he, she calls him over to give him this uh, lesson, and he got over to her house. It was very sparse, sparsely furnished to kind of paint the picture for you. And there was a sofa, an old fireplace, and a couple of chairs, and the room had hardware floors. This particular day, she had a Ouija board box set up just in the middle of the floor, and he said that to him that was spooky. So he went in with her, and she went to the mantel in the fireplace and grabbed a little package. It was a black silk-wrapped bundle, and she gave it to him. He sat there and waited. She told him to open it up. He opened it up and pulled it out, and when he opened up the bundle, it contained the planchette, the little, you know, piece for the, the Ouija board with the little uh-huh. eye. Uh-huh. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He said as soon as he touched the planchette, get this, the box on the floor began to rattle. Ooh. His teacher, he called her Angela, walked I'm out. over to the box. I'm gone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's enough. I'm, That's the end over. of the story for me. It's over. Walked, walked over to the box, opened it up, and had him sit down at the far end of the room. And she said, watch. He said he sat and watched, and she pulled the board out, put it on the floor face down. Get this. As he watched along its crease, the board started to rise up off the floor. The ends of the board began to come together. <laughs> And then it flattened out and made progress of six to eight inches across the floor, like an inchworm-style movement. N- no the thanks. board was walking across the floor, according to Gabriel. Wow. He said, I knew better to do it than to do anything. I-, I would have been out of there, like you said. He said, I sat perfectly still, but he was scared of his wits. While it was walking across the floor, Angela went over to the fireplace and started up a fire. While the board was still about two or three feet away from him, she said, wrap up the planchette. So he wrapped it up and in the silk, and the activity ceased. Now, he's saying the black silk is a, uh, like a shield for spiritual energy. If you want to contain something, you put it in, in black silk or in silk. He said once the board stopped moving, she had the fire going. She took the board and tossed it in the fire. Now, he said it kind of bugged him out. The board did not burn. It sat there. The flames... Uh, licked around it and underneath it there was a lot of smoke but the board com- appeared to be completely undamaged turns out the planchette was the important piece once he saw the board wasn't burning she said uh, burning she said okay now the planchette so she unwrapped the planchette uh, he unwrapped it and handed it to her and she tossed that into the fire nothing happened for a minute and then the planchette itself began to melt around the edges and catch fire and as it did then the board did too Wow. Yeah. I'm going to be wearing nothing but a complete black silk suit from now on. (laughs) Exactly. exactly. Black silk sheets. That's it. That's, I'm not even joking. That is so, even if it's not real, it's still the creepy story. I don't care how it is. Yeah, what a great story. But I don't know if it's not, it, it, I don't know, because it very easily could be. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I mean, totally those believe Ouija it. boards have some Man, bad mojo well, that links in you, with them. I can tell you, I'm with you guys because a lot of times, you know, sometimes on my show I'll talk to some of my friends in kind of the more new agey community occasionally with mm-hmm. shows like that. And they'll say, oh, Jim, there's no such thing as good and evil. 
when you think of evil, it's just a lower, a, a lower evolved spiritual state. There's no real evil. I don't buy that for a minute. I think there's evil. <laughs> I agree. I completely agree. All you got to do is read a history book. You can yeah, see exactly. where evil is. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and there's almost a yin and a yang for everything else in the universe, be. so it only makes sense. It's a balance. Yeah. There has to be a balance in everything. And if there's light, there must be darkness somewhere. Yeah, I, I do believe that. I and do believe that. That Ouija board, that's kind of like the it's the cell phone to the darkness. Yeah, that's, it's an like interest, you pick that's it up. An inter- yeah, that's a, the hotline. Yeah, it is, and it's like it rings, uh, like just a public phone somewhere out in the middle. Remember the pay phones that used to be? There's not yep. around. Kids don't remember <laughs> pay phones now. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know. It's like if you pick up that Ouija board, or you pick up that planchette, it rings. The, the pay phone in the middle of some bad area, and whoever answers it's who you got to deal with now. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that at all. <laughs> that, you know, I have a feeling that, you know, if you call up the wrong thing, you won't end up by putting the board back in the box. It might not want to leave. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's what I'm scared of. Well, that's what Kyle and I always joke about. We even talked about it on one of the shows was if you go Bigfoot hunting, you go out squatching, you'll know if Bigfoot's in the back seat of your car when you get ready to head home. He's not going to sneak yep. in and hide in there. You don't know what you're going to bring back with you when you go to these, let's go check out this creepy old asylum and get out of get out of Ouija board and see if we can have some. No, let's not. Let's just pretend it happened, and then let's just move on because yeah. I'm not going. Know, it's an interesting thing you say about ghost hunting because, you know, the thing is is that I'm not anti-ghost hunting. If somebody wants to go out in, in their – you know, I, I think private homes you got to be really careful about. But if they want to go out and check someplace, God bless them, I have no problem. But I think what people do is, you know, for example, a big pastime years ago used to be bowling. Let's go out bowling. And I think almost ghost hunting's become like that trivial now. People say, ah, oh, let's go out ghost hunting. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, first of all, if you believe there are ghosts and you believe that they reflect people who were over here, those are humans and they have souls, right? Right. right. And they should you, have some sort of feeling. Yeah, I don't think, you know, they're they're just an amusement. I don't think they should be just an amusement. So you should have some sensitivity there. And, you know, some people believe when you go out ghost hunting, you don't only contact ghosts, but you might get entities and spirits, and some of those might not be so nice. But So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, you know, think about what you're doing before you do it and, and try to go about it with maybe a a, a, a spirit of care. Uh, rather than just, oh, let's, because, you know, I see some of these ghost hunting shows and people are yelling at ghosts and come out here. And yeah. It's like, well, wait a minute. If, the, if there are really ghosts, would you like somebody to come in where you're at and yell at you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I just, uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's my thought process. I'm not anti ghost hunting. I just think we got to really think about. Well, and in my mind, you know, I believe in ghosts 100 percent. So there's no reason for me to go hunting. That's for it. Them. Yeah. I already know they exist. I've so. had an experience. I, I believe they're there. I don't, I don't have to go search for it. But yeah, that's a good point. I don't. I don't want it. And and if there's any ghosts listening, y'all don't have to come to my house or anything, man. <laughs> We're all good. We're all cool. Everything's cool. I'm gonna put some salt out. I don't want nobody sneaking up on me. Jim, do you now? You say you're gonna have a third book. You're coming out with a third one. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm hoping to have that by mid-August. So this uh, this truly is like all jokes aside, because I've seen it on your website and all this. It's gonna be the world domination of ghost stories. That's what's fixing to happen. Well, I, listen, there are a lot of ghost stories out there and a lot of different podcasts and a lot of different radio shows. You know, maybe I'm one of the bigger podcasts, but then, you know, all podcasts are tiny compared to coast to coast. I mean, there's always somebody bigger. But I just want to, um, you know, at the end of the day, when I look back on this, I, I hope that, you know, somehow, you know, let's say that I do this for 20 years, that I can archive the show somewhere and maybe hopefully – Someday after I'm gone, somebody reads a book or, or, or listens to one of the shows, and it has some kind of lasting value. And that's why I wanted to do the books. I mean, obviously, frankly, you know, there's, there's the business side of it. You want to sell books, of course. But also, I thought, you know, a lot of people don't know about podcasts, specifically a few years ago. Now it's becoming more and more popular every day with smartphones. But I thought, what a great way to put it in a book. So that way, these stories are somewhat codified. And maybe somebody never listens to a listens to a podcast, but they'll pick up a book, and then these stories will be around for a while, and and, and that's uh, that's the hope. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, too. I mean, that's Kyle and I have talked about wanting to do some books or something to have something left. That's one of the reasons we like doing the podcast, but we wanted to write too because it's just a feeling that a man can leave a little something whenever he's gone. 
yeah. you know, that you can oh, leave something behind. And I like the way that you bring up the thing with the podcast. Why don't you tell the listeners that we've had a few people contact us that were interested and we're talking about, you know, we'd like to podcast. And when Kyle and I, like we said, we told you off here, we only started six months or so ago. We've been talking about it for a year up to that point. There's, there's really, it's hard to find the information that you need to get started to do a podcast. And you have kind of filled that niche now. Well, um, you know, I've been doing this since 2005, and I have a certain process I use. And I started out very low budget. I mean, very low budget. And I got to thinking, and there's a lot of people out there who do teach podcasting. There's some fantastic teachers. But I have seen some things where people say, well, you've got to buy, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment to get started. Now, I think you could do a pretty darn good podcast on a shoestring. And I kind of have a formula for that because that's what I did probably about the first seven years I podcasted and basically built one of the more popular paranormal podcasts of its type out there, you know, doing it on a shoestring because I didn't have any choice the money to go buy a lot of equipment. So I thought what would be cool is if I could put together a little course, uh, basically a series of videos where I do screencasts and so forth and show point by point how you do this and not only how you do it, but how you do it without bankrupting yourself. Uh, so my course is entitled <laughs> why you should podcast and how to do it without breaking the bank. And I really do believe in the power of podcasting. I got to tell you, I think it's one of the, and I love video and video is great for a lot of different things. There are a lot of great things that video can do. I think podcasting, and I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's great for building relationships. People listen to your yes. show and over time, and I'm sure you hear it from your listeners. They feel like they know you, they like you, they trust you. Now, I think, you know, you should use the power for good. Yeah. I don't think that you should create a podcast to snow people. But if you're in business or you have a hobby, um, I think you could start a podcast and real quickly make yourself rise above the competition and do it inexpensively and spend a couple outer hours a week. And, for example, here, here's the analogy I use. And let's take it outside the realm of the paranormal. Let's say you're into bottle cap collecting. Now, I have no idea how many people in the world are into bottle cap collecting. Let's say 10,000 people in the whole world. Pretty obscure thing. But I assure you, there's somebody out there, and probably 10,000 somebodies, that's their life. That's what they live for. And they would love to be the world's best-known bottle cap collector. Well, I guarantee if you start a quality podcast, and every week you're talking... Uh, and interviewing people about bottle caps and what, how much is this one worth and where did you get started on it and that topic. And you start putting that out on the forums and letting people know about it. Before long, you're going to be maybe the world's best-known bottle cap collector. Yeah, makes sense. And you can basically become a star in your niche. I mean, basically, I was a guy who was interested in the paranormal in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> when I started in 2000, <laughs> like many, many other people who are interested. Now I'm kind of considered a, like my, uh, my wife and I laugh. I'm the world's smallest celebrity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I, I walk down the street. Nobody has any clue who I am. But among my listeners, like, oh, I got, you, I got an email from Jim Harold. Yeah. Which, How many downloads know, did you say you have now? Uh, I think I'm right around 12 million. Since, oh, my uh, God. Yeah, and nobody even recognizes you. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. That's yeah, great. But, but I mean, in within paranormal, a lot of people do know, with the paranormal niche. What I'm saying is, is that, if what I'm saying is, if you're looking for notoriety like a Kim Kardashian, this is not the thing to do. But if you want Dr. Oz, what I call is Dr. Oz fame, and it's probably not that big, but the idea within your area, you're considered to be an expert. Because like Dr. Oz, you know, he's known from TV and Oprah and uh, his own show and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, people who watch that show, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. And if someone would say, hey, you have a disease and you need a cardiothoracic surgeon, I bet you nine out of ten people who watched his show would say, I want Dr. Oz. They have no idea if he's any good or not. Right. Know, I'm sure he's great. I'm sure he's great. My point is, is that if you're a business person and you want to raise your uh, level of notoriety in your profession or you have a hobby and you want to raise your level of notoriety plus do it for the the enjoyment of it in in your own learning i've learned a ton doing that it, it's really just a very rewarding thing it's not for everybody but i think it's for a lot of people out there and a lot of people don't realize it's power and it is power wow yeah I mean, we've got 
approached by several people that tell you, like, we'd like to do it. I've always wanted to do one. I just didn't know how to go about it. Now, if people want to uh, view your, your courses, where do they find them at? It's uh, podcastwithjim.com. That's podcastwithjim.com. The cool thing is the rest of this week I'm running a special. Uh, the course will usually be $149. I've, for the first uh, 10 days or so, I'm making it $99 to give more people an opportunity. It's going to be a 10-part video course. Uh, at least five hours of content. If not, my first one was 42 minutes, so I have a feeling it's going to be a lot more than... <laughs> Plus, I'll be doing uh, weekly webinars uh, to answer questions for people enrolled in the class. So they can watch the videos, and then they could come on the webinars and ask me, uh, ask me questions. And, I mean, all the information is out there. If you want to spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours <laughs> trying to <We> find <laughs> it. Um, but my premise is one-stop shopping, and I can show you how I, I did it, and how you can do it inexpensively. And then if you want to upgrade over time and so forth, I certainly recommend that people do that. But there's no reason to break the bank. I, I kind of equate it to, you know, if you're going to start golfing, you know, do you go right away and do you Callaway's and the big Bertha's and the best equipment? Or do you start with maybe a little bit of cheaper basic set of exactly. clubs just to see if this is going to be something that you like? And if, if you know, if you look at, you get some cheap clubs, and you look at them in the garage, and they got dust on them. You don't feel too badly. If you've got those two thousand, three thousand dollar big Berthas in there, you might feel badly, especially after your wife gets a hold of you. <laughs> but uh, with this, you can start pretty modestly and see if this is something for me. And uh, I, I hope it helps a lot of people because I really believe in this medium. I, I, I really do. It's podcast with Jim. dot com. Now that's totally disconnected from the paranormal stuff. I won't talk about UFO and Bigfoot unless people want me to. And then my, my other main site for the paranormal stuff is jimherald.com. All right. And his, his podcast, again, are the Paranormal Podcast and Jim Herald's Campfire Stories. The books are Jim uh, Herald's Campfire Stories 1 and 2. I've read number 1. I can't wait to read number 2. Uh, and, and, of course, these courses now that you offer. I wish I would have found these courses uh, you know, 12 months ago when I started down that path. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for sure. Because there was, there was many a, a sleepless evenings where me and Kyle would sit here just t trying to figure things out and watch videos and all that stuff. And I would tell everybody, if you're interested in this, there's no better person on this planet to learn from than Jim. Jim, one last time, where's all the all your emails and all that stuff? Of course, we're going to put links to them, but go ahead and Yeah, if somebody wants to there, submit stories for your next yeah. book, I mean, how would they go about you know submitting a story to you? Well, usually what we do is we have them on the show. And, and then if it's the best of the best, I mean, I go through every story and pick out the, the best stories for the books. And uh, they would sign up to be on the show at jimherald.com slash campfire. That's jimherald.com slash campfire. If you go there, there's a handy-dandy form, and they can pick a time. I have several taping times listed, and they can get in touch with me, and we'll call them and have them on the show. If you want to listen to the shows, jimherald.com, also on iTunes. We also have a Roku channel now. If you have a Roku, uh, we're on Stitcher Radio. We're on TuneIn Radio. Pocket Casts, any of your podcatching apps, iTunes, of course, the Apple Podcasts app. But the, the starting point is jimherald.com. And I should mention, I also have a free paranormal newsletter that goes out every week. So I uh, recommend that all your folks sign up to that as well. And I also give away a five-pack, a five pack, I think, a five-pack of books every month to a lucky subscriber to that newsletter. So go over to jimherald.com and, and sign up for that as well. That'll be Perfect. Yeah, for sure. Jim, thanks so yeah, much thank you for so coming much. on here and, and laying it down for everybody. We've had a great time, and it's, we just appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Well, thank you, guys. And uh, as I always say to people on my show, stay spooky. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, and when your next book comes out, we're going to have to have you on again. I'd love to do it. Okay, don't get off the line.
and welcome back to Expanded Perspectives, your source for cryptozoology, alternative history, the paranormal, UFOs, and ratings of fried pies. And ratings of fried pies. <laughs> hope y'all right. enjoyed that interview, man. I, I do. I'm a yeah. huge fan of Jim. He's one of the reasons that I really wanted to get into doing this. Well, he's got like three podcasts, doesn't he? Well, and now he's got where you can go and, and contact him and everything, and you can learn how to do it yourself. Yeah. He mm-hmm. gives That's like podcasting cool. 101, which is awesome. It is awesome. It's awesome. Speaking man. of uh, his podcast... What about another podcast that recently had us on? Folks, hop on iTunes and go check out All Day Paranormal. Yes. With Crystal and Manny. They are some new friends of ours that's just started their podcast, and they just had us on. Yep. I mean, we just finished doing an interview with them, just on their chat and talking about some some of the gin and the black-eyed kids and the Slender Man, just some 21st century stuff. And it was fun because me and Kyle just kind of got to hang out and kind of give our thoughts on some things as crazy and as silly as it is. I mean, because we don't really know anything. But uh, <laughs> but we had a great, great time. It was really fun, yeah, and I really enjoyed it. And, and they have can, a good show, man. Yeah, they have a good show. They're going to they're just starting out. So, yeah. you know, they've only got like four or five episodes out. Mm-hmm. So they're brand new. But, man, they, they seem to really know what they're doing. I liked it. Well, what I like about it, too, is they're just being themselves. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's a big mm-hmm. thing. Is and, and I think all of our listeners can truly appreciate that because, I mean, there's so many times you get people that you can tell are fakes or they're phonies, even investigators or even anything like that, you know. And it, you can always you smell it instantly like those guys are full of shit. But. Man, they're, I mean, Crystal and Manny are really just, they're, they're just really being themselves. I think they're a lot like us, just have an open mind yeah, to things. Yeah, that's you know? it, just having a good time. You can go to, uh, she's got a blog called GetSpooked.net. That's correct, yeah. And it's a blog of, of paranormal things that she covers a bunch of stuff on. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, y'all go check it out. If you want to hear us, we ought to be coming up. We might be out by the time this one's out. Yeah, we might be on today. If you're listening to know. this, yeah, you might be able to go and download it right now. We might be on there giggling and chatting like a couple of schoolgirls, <laughs> me and Kyle are. Yeah. Anyways, it was it was really fun. Yeah, so. it's fun to talk. Yeah, I mean, it's and like I said, keep sending them. Preston, you sent us the email. I haven't responded to yet because you scared the hell out of me. So if you're listening to this, Preston, my friend, wow is all <laughs> I got for you, man. <laughs> yeah, but we get some. And folks, please keep sending them. I mean, we get some good emails all the time, and some of the emails we get from y'all, no lie, creeps me and Kyle out. Like we'll read them and we'll call each other and be like, "Did you read that?" He's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Holy crap! What do you think about that?" So. Yeah, I mean, keep sending them. We enjoy talking to everybody. And please, you know, rate and review the show. Have all your friends rate and review the show. If you know anybody that hasn't, point your finger sternly at them and say, you got to rate and review the show. Or just hijack their computer and you write the review again. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Just copy and paste your review and do it under their name. It would be awesome. (laughs) Folks, uh, we've got uh, some changes coming. Well, one of the changes before you get into that is I'm thinking of setting up a a voicemail where people can leave a voicemail on our show. Or if they have a story, rather than emailing us the story, they can just yeah. go ahead and tell us the story in first person, and then we can play it on the air. Or if you want to just call in and say, hey, you guys are doing a great job, or hey, you guys suck, and I hope you die in a car crash, you can call and do it's going to be there. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely play that. That would be funny. <laughs> that will be funny. Yeah, if you want to troll us, we'll listen to it, and I'm sure we'll probably put it up. So. You could get on it. You could come on and just do a, a commercial for us, telling everybody out there how much you liked it and your name and stuff. Anyways, I'm thinking about implementing that. Yeah, and, and we've got, oh, what have I done? I'm pulling cords. And we've got more stuff, too. Like we said, we've got a few more changes coming up. So uh, we're not going to let the cat out of the bag just yet because Kyle and I are really working on it to try to make it a good thing. But, uh, yeah, so if you enjoy it and you're having fun with us, please rate and review if you haven't already. And if you have, thank you so much. And uh, I got nothing else, man. Well, who do we got coming up next time? I don't know because we've got so Gosh. many of them. We've got so many of them. we got an interview this week. And we got one of this. Folks, let us, I tell you what you do. If any of you out there on Facebook or on Twitter or want to email us, let us know. We've got some ancient history. We've got a couple in ancient history. Uh huh. We've got uh, a, a one of a guy we talked to about some conspiracy theory stuff. Yep. We've got some that has to do with a little alien abduction stuff. Yep. If there's something y'all want to hear out of those three, fire us an email. Shoot us an email. Shoot us a tweet. Shoot us a Facebook message. If something like that grabs y'all's fancy, that way it kind of helps us out. Because Kyle and I have got, I'll tell you how it ended up happening. We ended up contacting a bunch of the people that we've read their books, things like that. And they were like, they were more than happy to come on. You know? We're like, we have to do it this time. Yeah, we, we got to do it right now. We got to do it right now. And, you know, and, and we're like, okay, we're going to work with them. Boom. So we get it done. And then you look up and we've got like six or seven of them, pal, sitting there. And we're like, how are we going to release these? In an order where you don't get overly burned out with it. It's not like four of them all ufology or four of them all crypto. Right, yeah. We're trying to break it all up. 
And so especially since we switched to the format this year. Yes. With every other episode being every other yeah. And every so, other episode being you. So we're trying to we're trying to find the rhythm on that whole deal. So if there's anything out there, we've got a few interviews. If there's anything out there that y'all want to hear that's in ancient history, that's uh like I said, a little ufology, you know, a little conspiracy stuff, some fun stuff, let us know. We'll you know, we'll work it into the whole thing. And other than that, man, we're just we're having a great time and we appreciate each and every one of you. Absolutely so appreciate much. everybody. Thank you so much. Tell your friends, if they don't listen, to start listening. Sternly, with your finger pointing at them. <laughs> and uh, we are still working on some other stuff, you know, as far as merchandise for the show. To have, like, man, I'm going to have to get yeah, some man, koozies made up, man. Yeah, it is tough sometimes. I mean, you get this the, thread and, started, and it yeah. just kind of never goes anywhere. And then the, so. and the artwork is tough for me to come up with, a, you know, the artwork that well, I We really have like. an artist, but we're trying to get a, the guy motivated or, or the time to, to actually produce something for us. Yeah, so. yeah, so... Like I said, it's just it's a constant struggle, but it's a good struggle that we really enjoy doing, and, and we really appreciate all y'all sticking with us and, and coming along. We're having a blast. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Stay safe.